Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. Matthew Levering, a very, I would say, famous Catholic theologian and philosopher. Uh, Dr. Levering or Matthew, could you briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, it's wonderful to be here. So um, thank you for having me. And I teach here at Mundelein Seminary. I mainly teach in their STL program. And then my position is the James and then Mary D. Perry Jr. Chair of Theology. I mentioned that because um, they were so generous to endow, but, and I feel very grateful to them always. You know, they're wonderful people. All right. Well, so Dr. Levering, today we are here to talk about Vatican II, which of course is a controversial, complicated subject. So uh, as we dive in, I just want to ask you, you know, uh, before we get into Vatican II, why is it relevant, particularly at this moment? Like, why are people talking about Vatican II? What, what is its relevance for Catholics and even for, you know, the entire world? Vatican II, I think it'll always be important because, you know, it occurred at, it occurred at such a fascinating historical moment. So to me, to me, that's the that's the main um, interest. You know, you're again the early early sixties. It's it's a part of, of sort of the whole world was was changing so rapidly. You got to remember that that was the period in which um, colonialism comes to an end. You know, obviously World War II was very very decisive in a number of ways, but colonialism uh, came to an end pretty much pretty quick pretty quickly in the next decades after World War II. And so then you, that made a huge difference for the, for the whole world, for um, Africa, for, um, you know, Asia, everywhere near the Near East and so on. Anyway, there was, there was also the fact that Vatican II occurs um, after the Holocaust. And, and I see that as um, tremendously significant because um, the church simply had to, had to, to renew itself in terms of um, the church's thinking about the Jewish people, that had to happen, and, and thank God it did happen. And um, so then there was also just the fact um, that the early 60s, by that time, you, you had uh, um, historical biblical criticism had sort of uh, reached, um, you, you might say, uh, the, the, if you read commentaries from, from that period, they, they basically know what, what we know today. And part of that reason for that is that the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, um, the whole study of Second Temple Judaism was, um, had emerged by that time. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls had been found and they'd been um, interpreted and were being interpreted. <laughs> but uh, so there was just gain, a tremendous gain in knowledge um, of the biblical world and that the Catholic Church needed to, um, you know, need, needed also to, uh, you know, uh, re resonate in some way with, with these um, insights and these developments and in, in all these ways. So intellectually, politically, and then vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people, uh, all these things were extremely important. And so the church, uh, by God's providence, um, had the Second Vatican Council. And, and we have so many wonderful um, documents from that council. So aside from the four constitutions of the council itself, what are other resources that are really useful for understanding uh, the theology and all the things that happened at the council? Well, um, my mentor, Father Matthew Lamb, you know, was very concerned about that question. You know, in part, there wasn't, there were, haven't been that many resources, at least, um, and at least um, in, through the early 2000s. So he and I co-edited um, a couple of volumes um, one of them is called um, Vatican II Renewal, Renewal Within Tradition, and it has essays by a number of wonderful scholars, um, such as Cardinal Dulles and many other people. And then um, the other is called um, The Reception of Vatican II, talking about the 50 years um, after Vatican II. Now, so the first volume is about how Vatican II relates to things before Vatican II. And then the second volume is about, um, you know, the last 50 years, um, you know, since the council. So anyway, so we were, we were trying to add to the literature. And then there's, there's many other, other things. Things are being written um, now. Uh, but, but I think I can, I can leave it at that for now. Mm -hmm. So then 
moving on then, what would you say are the strengths and weaknesses of the Second Vatican Council? Well, I, as I see it, the, the great strength is, um, you know, if you look at ancient constitutions, there is a tremendous desire to proclaim um, Jesus Christ and, and him as Lord. So that's got to be the strength of anything Catholic. And, and, I, and I see, um, you know, to my mind, there's no weakening of, of the Catholic Church in these documents. Um, the Catholic Church, you know, proclaims itself as, as the church that Jesus founded, um, the church to which everyone is called, and the church um, that, that can instruct the whole world with the light of Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church says, says really, it says that man cannot know himself uh, without the light of Christ. And in fact, man cannot know himself without the church's uh, instruction, without the, the aid of the church. So um, these are very beautiful things to say, very true. Um, the Catholic Church talks about the Bible and talks about the historicity and truth of, of the Bible and, and the, um, the accuracy of the New Testament, you know, and, and the reliability of, of, our, the, the, of the documents of our faith. The Catholic Church um, talks about, you know, many other things. Um, I don't want to just ramble on. I just think there's a lot of great stuff in this council. <laughs> Yeah, so then uh, <clears throat> it'll be worth talking to you about the controversies and we'll get to those eventually. But do you, so you would, you would say that you have a, a positive view of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, you, you're not, you, w you wouldn't really isolate anything negative out of the council. Oh, you know, um, if we want to talk about negative, <laughs> um, there, there, are certainly, there are certainly negative things that, that happen um, for in the world and, and, in the, and also negative developments in the church. Um, they, especially, they were beginning before the council, um, obviously. Now remember, the church has always had negative things happening. <laughs> you got, there's no, if you look at any era, you're, you're going to find plenty of problems. You know, it's just right now, people are very focused on, on this particular era. You know, the era right before and, and right after the council. And they're focused on that era, era because these problems that emerge in that period have not been dealt with in any adequate way. So um, uh, that's what's up. And that's what, that's what the problems are. They're definitely gonna be, they're definitely problems. Now, I don't, I don't see the council itself as, as um, I don't see it as perfect. <laughs> you know, the documents aren't perfect. They're not like, they're not like uh, Moses went up and got the documents and, and it turned out it was the Second Vatican Council. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? Come on, come on, we gotta, we gotta be serious here. These, is, these are conciliar documents. It's a, you know, it's a wonderful, valid <laughs> ecumenical council. It has to be interpreted like any council and it has been well interpreted by um, the, the popes that came after the council, they've been interpreted it. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's problems in any, in any kind of, of, of document. You have to, got to think about like Nicaea, for example, at, at the Council of Nicaea, they, they did not proclaim um, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. You know, you know, that was it turned out to be, it turned out that was kind of a problem. <laughs> you know, so you, you did have to have another council. You know, to, to, to. Um, you know, and there was a huge amount of strife and troubles, you know, so the council doesn't do everything. It doesn't, it doesn't say everything perfectly. And then of course there's been, a, um, you know, some serious problems in the world and in the church in, um, over the past um, 50 years. And these problems, as I mentioned, just haven't, haven't yet been resolved. You know, it's, it's part of the difficulties of the time period we live in. And every time period, though, has, has real, real difficulties. All right. So now, as we approach the Second Vatican Council in our interview, um, I want to ask you, uh, what parts of it are infallible? Or is the whole thing infallible? And maybe it would help the audience, too, to understand how exactly does infallibility work, especially in the case of uh, council, right, the magisterium, the pope. So kind of, you know, what parts of Vatican II are infallible and how does the Catholic Church understand infallibility? Uh, okay, wonderful. Yeah, now, in terms of infallible, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, look, you know, the, I mean, the, that's, I mean, infallible is a strong word and it pertains, um, you know, it can pertain to the extraordinary magisterium, the ordinary magisterium, you know, but not, certainly not everything in the council is infallible. That would be, that'd be crazy. But the, the word, I mean, you have to ask yourself more like, like what in the council is true? And, and there are, um, there are elements, um, you know, obviously that, uh, that, and when you when you're asking this type of question, though, you you do need to to kind of look to tradition, you know, and to look to scripture, you know, and so on. You you make judgments that that way. Um, again, though, I, I I'm not quite sure. I mean, you can go through the council and kind of think about the theological notes and the the weight of particular conciliar statements, and and then the weight of the constitutions versus the weight of the decrees and or whatever you know and you can have different theological weights and notes and 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 this this type of thing you know you you can you can do all that and and i think that that probably does need to be done but but again um for my part uh, i'm I, i'm perfectly willing to um you know receive the council as a whole and i i just don't I myself think that the council is, is true, you know, in terms of the conciliar texts, I think they're, they're true. And I don't think that they, I don't think that they deviate, you know, from the tradition of our, of our faith. I don't think they, I don't think they violate scripture, um, which is a, one of the monuments uh, or any monument, monument of tradition. I, I believe that the council is, is true. Now um, they're, the areas that have been most contested have often have to do with dignitatis humanae, you know, that, that, and then, then certain elements, although like with Sacrosanctum Concilium, you know, the, obviously there, a lot's going to depend on the implementation, you know, at least as I see it, you know, in dignitatis humanae, um, there, there are fights about whether that, that is in continuity with um, the tradition of our faith. But once you get to Sacrosanctum Concilium, as far as I can tell, um, the fights are, are mainly over the implementation. You know, um, it, where Sacrosan and Concilium has these wonderful dogmatic parts or wonderful parts of theological teaching. And then it also has a lot of parts that are very practical. And so it's like, um, do this, do that, you know, uh, make, set up this committee, you know, set up, and I always don't like committees. <laughs> you, know, once, you know, I think that's worrisome. <laughs> if you're gonna have a committee involved, uh -oh. You know, but a lot of a lot of it's going to have to do with the, the implementation of, of of that document. But and that's also the case. You know, once you once you start looking in terms of Catholic social teaching, you get a lot of Catholic social teaching and Gaudium et Spes toward toward the back of it. You know, so as you go as you read on Gaudium et Spes, you, know, you have to remember that there's the Catholic social teaching has principles, but it also has um, applications, things that are that popes say and, and, and so on. And I was reading this great passage from Joseph Ratzinger. It's, it's on page 31 of Dogma and Preaching, the, um, you know, the Ignatius ed edition of Dogma and Preaching. So Ratzinger on page 31 of this book, he says, he comes right out and says it. He says, look, um, you know, at a certain, before the council, the, um, we gotta be a little careful. We can't be ultra montanist. Ratzinger's writing in 1973. And so he firmly defends the authority of the papal magisterium, but he does say, "Look, let's not let's not say that everything that any pope says is is um, infallible." Mm -hmm. You know, and he points to he points to the 19th century, and and um, remember there were um, you know the popes would say this and that, and not everything that the popes in the 19th century said is infallible, and that often pertained to social teaching. You know, so. Obviously, you know, a lot, there's going to be a good bit in Gaudium et Spes uh, that is, as you say, not, not, not infallible and certainly can be contested as you, as you go back in the back. But the principles, the principles of, of the thing are, are true. Um, but I think you can, you can contest um, elements as you, as you read on in Gaudium et Spes. Okay. Okay. Did I, I worry? Always worry about rambling on. So no, I you're good. Stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so just to kind of expand on, I guess this question, right? 
um, when, when the Catholic church like says that its teachings are infallible, let's say, or, you know, a council forms and the magisterium kind of, uh, gets together in this extraordinary fashion. Right. Um, it's not the case that there's like a formula for infallibility, let's say, where it's like, Oh, when they, maybe, maybe it's like, uh, if the council says something like this has been divinely revealed to us by the Holy spirit, or, you know, the Pope makes an ex-cathedral pronouncement, that's when you can really know that, like, there's no ambiguity there, right? But when there's a lot of moving parts, it seems as if, like, over time, we realize what part um, is infallible, what part is true, what part stays with us. Is that, like, a fair summation of, you know, knowing which claim or which statement is infallible? Or, you know, am I, am I thinking too systematically here? But uh, I, you know, I think it might be, I, I, I would encourage other people to um, research along these lines, you know, to, this is the type of research that um, the Catholic Church has done in the past. Uh, for example, um, you know, think of Ludwig Ott and, and all the different theological notes in the, in the Neos class, in Neos class of theology, which I really liked. Um, you, you would, everything would come with a theological note and uh, in terms of the weight of authority that, mm. um, that it, the doctrine had or the teaching had. So you would, um, as you're reading along in anything, you know, you would be able to um, receive um, some sense of the, of the weight um, of, that, of that teaching and therefore how, how binding it, it would be upon consciences or, or so on. Well, see, you know, but I, I, I think that's fine. And, and after, after Trent, it also, after the Council Trent, um, there was also an emphasis on, on this. Um, you, you find it in Melchior Cano as he talks about the different theological loci and different, different weight um, of, you know, how do you figure out what the church actually teaches, if the church teaches it definitively, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And, and these, these debates, um, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, the, the problem with it all is, is that you can kind of get yourself tied up in, in knots somewhat as you, as you look for like the final list of, of the definitive things you must believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can get tied up in knots and then, <laughs> then you, might, you might get in trouble because you might say, you might say, well, I believe this definitive list and you, you make up this definitive list of all the things from Vatican II that you must believe believe in the, and that have to be believed and then, then the other things that might not have to be believed and then you come with this and then and then they say and and you do it all based on on um theological weight of constitutions versus this or that or whatever and then then some might come on and say but who made infallible your your um list of your your way of doing the theological notes you know has has a pope or a council defined you see um, the different weights and different theological note of in terms of authority. Have popes and council defined that? And you, you do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what, what I'm trying to say is that um, that you you know you would also need the magisterium to give infallible infallible um, authority to your weighting system, to your criteria. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you understand what you see that? You, you would need you would need that if you're going to give a final list of all the things <laughs> in Vatican II that you must believe that we all must believe de fide. Yeah. You, know, you would you would also therefore need a pope um, in a very in a formal way. You know, I think to to give um, to say that you're you're the 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 criteria you've used the the weighting system you know that you've used is infallible. You know, it's and you, um, until until that happens, you know, you might still have doubts because someone else might have another waiting system, <laughs> and they they might make a list too. They might make another list. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And they might say, "Well, wait a second, <laughs> you know, well, here's my list, <laughs> you know, and and it's not as big as your list." <laughs> mm -hmm. Look, well, I, I honestly think I think that um, people get themselves a little tired of not on this type of stuff. And, and the basic bottom line, as I see it, the bottom line is that um, if you read the documents batting two constitutions and, docu and the other documents, what, what's gonna hit you is a lot of Christian truth. It's, it's true. 
you know, the, the dogmatic claims made about the church, about Christ, about, about the Trinity, you know, about Eucharistic sacrifice, mm-hmm. you know, about, about Christ revealing man to, to himself, about anthropology in light of Christ, um, all sorts of things that are present in the council. And, I, and I've just named a few um, about the way that we ought to treat the Jews, you know, about mission and the fact that mission is necessary, about, about salvation and whether anyone can be saved who is not a member, a visible member of the Catholic Church. You know, all these questions are addressed in the council and, and the council um, gives truth, you know, and that truth is rooted in tradition, but also um, develops, you know, in certain cases, in certain cases there are developments that are found in the council. That, you know, I see the council as true. And, you know, that, to me, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, whether or not it's infallible and whether, whether there may be some things, elements in the council. I, I think there are some elements in the council for sure that are, that are not infallible and that are open to debate. You know, I've, I've told you about already mentioned, you know, like parts, later parts of, you know, applications that you might find in God even best or, mm. you know, things that are just sort of things like that and, and so on. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Help so me out here. Can, there. <laughs> yeah. So if I can just uh, come in real quick. So then I noticed that you talked about how some parts are true and how some parts might be infallible. Right. And I guess like for the audience, they might think, Oh, I thought that meant the same thing to a Catholic, but I guess like, um, when we talk about infallibility, we're talking about specifically the authority of the church saying that this is true and almost like the, the, the debate stops in a way, right? Like this is, part of the deposit of faith, if you will. Well, like there might be parts that are true, but haven't been like dogmatically, you know, let's say sanctioned. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and then also what I'm saying is that, that if, you, if you approach um, the, the council saying like, what is infallible? You yeah. know, what here is infallible? You know, um, it's like the way it's, I, I'm telling you, it can be like the way that my, um, my children eat a casserole. You know, they, remember since they don't like any vegetables or anything green or any onions or anything, or any mushrooms or anything that doesn't, isn't just perfectly like a noodle or cheese. So they will, what they do is they come to the casserole. They say that some aspects of this casserole are infallible and they believe in noodles and they believe in cheese. And then they, then they like dig out everything you know, they go like a, like a surgeon, you know, you know, it's like a surgeon, you know, you're kind of, you dig, you dig out the final, the, the tiny little kernels of things and, and you, you're, and then you have a big pile over here of kind of green things. Do, do you see, this isn't any way to, you know, this isn't any way to receive counsel. You, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? This is, I'm trying, I'm trying to warn against that. I'm trying to caution, you know, yeah. that's, that's my, that's my point here is that, you know, like, Yes, yes, there are things we can say in the council that are infallible. You know, if you want, if you really want to read it like that, you know, um, you just start start with Godium, start with Sacrosanctum Concilium. You know, and you can you can see the sources um, when Sacrosanctum Concilium starts talking about Jesus Christ. You can go back to Nicaea. You know, you can um, when it starts talking about the Eucharistic sacrifice. You can go to the Council of Trent. You know, and and so on. You, you see, so there are there are plenty of things that are infallible, and you can see the sources. And then there's also some dogmatic developments that you can that that are made clear. You know, um, for example, in Lumen Gentium, there's there's some dogmatic development um, regarding bishops and and so on. Um, but anyway, again, my my suggestion is that this isn't really quite the right way to read the council. You know, um, because I think the council is is reliable in in sense that yeah there's some there may be some things that are going to need that are not um not binding you know but in general i just think it's a pretty good counsel you know i mean i don't think it's that hard to tell the stuff that that is not definitive basically people get worried about dignitas humana they get worried about some aspects of gaudium spes mm-hmm. and um then they they get really worried about the implementation of sacrosanctum concilium and then before you know it, they just think, why do we bother having a dumb council at all? <laughs> that tends to be the thing, you know, because like if the church is in such 
um, strife, if there's such strife and such danger facing the church um, today in the year 2020, you know, this dumb council didn't do any good at all. So it's, you know, then they get mad. Mm -hmm. It tends to be what if they basically say, um, they basically uh, respond then very negatively to the council, but it doesn't usually have anything to do hardly with, with almost all the council. It, it's just a, maybe a few, a few documents. Now, some people, some people get mad at, at the council for sort of opening up cans of worms. Um, for example, let me give you an example of that. Like in, in Dave Erbum, Dave Erbum, um, you know, really insists upon biblical interpretation, you know, being done in, in light of the fathers, in light of the analogy of faith, and, and so on, in light of the magisterium. But, but Dave Erbum also um, very strongly, um, you know, allows for uh, historical critical uh, research into the context of and and the um, insofar as possible the authors or the and certainly their context, you know what they meant to say and what you know what were their contexts. That's historical research. So Dave Arum really allows for that. Well, um, people feel mad at they feel angry at Dave Arum for opening up a can of worms. Um, mm -hmm. And Dave Arum also is is the first counsel to talk about dogmatic development. You know, like at the Council of Trent, um, it was more easy. You just said, um, like, the church has always taught that there were seven sacraments. You know, the Council of Trent just says stuff more like that, you know, just like, just like, what do you mean? The church has always taught that there is, are seven sacraments. Now, historically, um, that's not the case. Now, it doesn't mean they're not seven sacraments, or always were seven sacraments. But the church, um, <laughs> look, um, the, the whole doctrine of the sacraments developed in the 12th century. It, there were developments. It's not. It's not like there were like everything was made new it's, or invented, but but there were um, you know there were real developments that occurred in the 12th century. And and the um, the council fathers at Trent um, did did not you know discuss that. Well, but but Dave Arabum does discuss um, as you know. Dave Arabum mentions um, doctrinal development. Well, so some people even get mad at that, you know, they get concerned and does say, you're opening up a can of worms that are very dangerous. So, so people respond to the council in different ways. Um, generally, it has to do with um, a, very few, a very few texts of the council, but sometimes people get mad at the whole council for opening up cans of worms, getting us into a miserable mess, and, and um, basically allowing allowing the church to be very vulnerable to um, what you might call uh, liberal Catholicism with a capital L, mm -hmm. or you might call it modernism. That was also another name, or you could call it um, liberal Protestantism. All these things, all these phrases um, have to do with theology that is not, not dogmatic. You know, in other words, that with um, theology that denies um, that Christianity is a dogmatic religion, that Christianity involves truth that is enduring truth. You see, liberal Protestantism um, just says, hey, Christianity is solely about um, caring for the poor, building a, an authentic community, and, and then um, this sort of gesturing toward the ineffable uh, mystery, the mystery of the divine. But um, for, liberal Protestant, for a liberal Protestant thinker, you know, um, all the dogmas about Jesus Christ or about sacraments, those can all be changed tomorrow because those are, those are just, um, they may be help, helpful for some people for their religious experience, but other people don't don't need them. This is the liberal Protestant view, you know. Anyway, so there are liberal Catholics with a capital L, and there are um, they, they were called modernists um, in the nineteenth, the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, but but obviously they're they're still um, still liberal Protestantism within Catholicism, of course, and I mean it's called just liberal Catholicism, or with a capital L. Um, well, so people get mad at the council for, um, uh, you know, for allowing, allowing um, there to be, um, like if you have dogmatic development, before you know it, you might have some or other. It's can, can of worms arguments, slippery slope type arguments. These, these tend to be the things, but, but um, you know, so, but sometimes people have concerns about specific things about in um, Dignitas Humanae or wherever. Mm -hmm. there, there can be some texts that, that people are, are bothered about. Yeah, so we can probably go through um, each of the constitutions rather quickly just to get your comments on them. 
So for instance, um, okay. So for instance, uh, there is a Sacro Sanctum Concilium, and my question is, how did that constitution affect the liturgy? And can you explain the current controversies around the liturgy? Well, so they were they were seeking um, a greater participation of of the laity and in internal and external participation. For example, they were seeking um, you know more more hymns and more um, more lay responses. They um, they were also seeking um, a wider scriptural diversity in terms of the readings. So they wanted the Old Testament to be read, um, not not solely the Psalms, but also they wanted an Old Testament reading. You know, they um, they they felt that the laity, um, you know, were were not um, participating interiorly as deeply as as should be in in understanding what the what um, the reality is fake. Now, the, the problem was um, that, that, you know, the fact is that, that the, the, you know, the church has always had this problem somewhat. The, it's difficult, you know, it, people have trouble being Christian. You, you know, they kind of show up for mass. It's, and they kind of, and a lot of them don't come to mass. This has always been the case, you know. Um, people, people have trouble living the Christian life of, of truly participating interiorly. You know their hearts, and so, so the council. So this was a problem that the people, the people um, recognized. You know, in the 20th century, they were concerned. You know, that young people and and um, uneducated people, and and educated people, just simply were falling away from faith, and and it was just accelerated after after the Second World War um, World War Two. You know, and this. Look, faith, the faith was declining. It, it was um, among young people. Um, there was a lot of warning signs, and so they thought they thought they tried to, you know, renew it uh, by renewing the um, by renewing the liturgy. They also had to deal with the fact of, um, you know, the the, the um, global expansion of Catholicism. You know, meaning that you have Catholicism in Asia, Catholicism in, in Africa, and places where um, Catholicism hadn't been as um, spread as much, and so that that de they also then address the issues of what of inculturation. Now these issues had been addressed before, but they um, the council in Sacramento Concilium addresses um, issues related to inculturation. You know, and the basic idea is, is everybody going to have to have build European cathedrals, which are very expensive. You know, so how are you going to build a European cathedral? You know, in in Africa, different, which if in countries that might not have the money, and and then um, get all get everybody singing Gregorian chant. Now, remember, the Sacramento Concilium um, still advocates for the primacy of Gregorian chant. Look, it's it's just, but the question was like. It, um, in some in some countries, are we really not going to say that everybody's got to be doing Gregorian chants? Well, is that really fundamental, you know, to um, the liturgy for for all cultures? And and that the the council um, thought that it might not be. You, you, you see, this was I mean, to me, you were talking about like infallible and non-infallible. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it can be debated. Like, if if you want to debate it, if you want to say that. If you want to say that Gregorian chant is part of the deposit of faith, remember the council advocates for the primacy of Gregorian chant. I'm not. I'm not criticizing myself. I, I think the council itself proclaims the primacy of Gregorian chant, and I, I accept that very much. Mm -hmm. But but if if you're if you're saying that everybody in Africa and other countries where that have their own musical traditions, you know where Christianity has has spread widely only in the past um, two centuries. You know, if you're saying that all those people have to now have a European education and be sent to Germany to, to learn a grand chant or something. Anyway, to me, this is a debatable matter. Yeah, you know, I, I have a position on it, but, but and this is debatable. So these are the things, these are the things that the council was trying to do. Um, like Sacrosanctum Concilium doesn't say anything about moving the altar around and changing the, um, you know, the direction of liturgical worship. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't, 
It doesn't. It doesn't reject Latin. In fact, it, it in fact it insists upon the primacy of Latin in the Mass. Although it does say that vernacular can be used, and as soon as you as soon as you open the door, you know you do have um, you do have potential for slippery slope. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so th these are uh, these are um, may, that's maybe enough to say. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, so and then the the hot the hot uh, kind of phrase is the novus ordo, right? That's what everyone's talking about, like. Uh, you know, um, well, that was after the council. Uh, that was after the council. Okay. Okay. So like, I've always heard no the Novus Ordo being associated with Vatican II, but basically the council set the door oh, yeah. for the Novus Ordo, basically. Um, uh, no, in, in truth, I mean, there was some, there was some development toward the Novus Ordo. Um, there, as far as I understand it, look, I'm, I'm not a, um, I'm not a historian of religion, mm -hmm. but I do think there was some, during the council, during the council itself, there was some development toward the Novus Ordo. I think that's pretty, that's clear, but, um, but, but you got to remember, yeah, the, the, um, the new, the whole thing comes after the council. That's not part of Sacrosanum Concilium. The Novus Ordo is not, is, is not a, um, it's not conciliar. It comes after the council and the whole issue with Novus Ordo, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it would be like, does the Pope have the authority to approve a um, liturgical rite? Mm -hmm. Now, I think, I think it, I think it, it may be the case that liturgical rites, um, you know, written after the council or put together right after the council, you know, maybe there needs to be renewal, including reform, or you have the whole liturgical movement that was all about reform. So I, don't, I, I see no reason why we can't have reform. You know, if, if, I mean, liturgists always love to reform the liturgy, you know, and and I I think I think that the the altar, um, the direction of the of the worship, um, the direction the priests and the people need to face the same in the same direction, you know, they need to face the altar um, during the Eucharistic prayer. I mean, I've written about that, and I think that's I think that's the case. But um, so I, I certainly agree with um, Joseph Ratzinger on on that. But my, my point, though, is yeah, this this wasn't um, none of these things, including the Novus Ordo. You know, these these were things that were part of the implementation. You know, there was remember the Novus Ordo. The, the Second Synod Concilium does say that it wants um, some renewal and reform of the rite, the Roman rite. You know, so it does call for that. It calls for some renewal and reform. You know, and and um, you know, there were, again, it would had to do the things like I like I mentioned um, earlier, you know, but it doesn't it doesn't spell that out in terms of in terms of like um, you know what we want is it, it's just not spelled out, mm -hmm. you know. So it does open the door for it opens the door for um, different ways of implementing it. You can implement the council faithfully in this way or in that way, and and then a lot of it also is is um, you know trial and error, you know, they, they had certain goals in mind. They wanted a deeper participation. They wanted um, more use of the whole Bible and they wanted more, more uh, lay response, you know, and lay involvement in terms of the hymns and so on. And, and they wanted the responses, you know, they wanted more, um, they wanted to be sure that the laity, uneducated people, and they were especially thinking about uneducated people who were all becoming Marxists, and also the educated people who were all becoming Marxists, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, at that time, <laughs> you know, but they want to be sure that the, all, that they could understand the liturgy, and they knew what they were participating in, and they also wanted to be sure about enculturation, um, that the liturgy would be something um, that could be adapt adaptable. Um, to cultures that only only recently had been receiving Christianity. These were all concerns that they had, but I don't think that, going back to infallible, I don't think that anything that they said was infallible in terms of that. Mm -hmm. They were just trying to implement, um, you know, it was really kind of like the liturgical movement. They were trying to implement the liturgical movement's goals. And then, and then kind of you have, that's different though from, the actual implementation, the council and the implementation are not the same thing. All right. So I was going to talk to you about maybe, uh, let's see, you already talked about uh, De, De Burum a little bit, but uh, let's see here. There's Lumen Gentium and Gaudium et Spes. I think I'll just kind of uh, put those questions aside because I want to get into some of the uh, questions that one of my friends wanted to ask. 
So I have a friend of mine, I think it's okay if I drop his name. His name is Daniel Jackson. And he collects, you know, a lot of papal okay. encyclicals. He, he even like, he even goes so far as to like, I think buy them and translate them or get translated versions of them. So he's very passionate about, you know, this pastime, this hobby of his. So he had three questions he wanted to ask you. Okay. And the, they're, they're quite technical. So, you know, um, you don't have to respond to every single bit and piece, but just uh, what the, you know, the main thrust of the question, which is usually the last part. So here's the first question that Daniel wanted to ask. So he said, some see discontinuity between Dignitatis Humanae and earlier papal documents like Merari Vos, Quanta Cura, Libertas, uh, Praestantissimum, and Immortale Dei on the matter of religious liberty and church-state relations. Is there a change in doctrine or in policy? Maybe I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, well, yes, yeah, so Dignitas Humanae would be the most controversial of, mm -hmm. of all the all the documents. You know, um, Joseph Ratzinger talks about Dignitas Humanae, and I believe he talks about it in that in that famous 2005 um, homily that he gave, um, you know, I, I believe it was to the Cardinals. I, I, I've forgotten now. Um, anyway, um, there's no doubt there's some development of doctrine, but here, here's, I mean, here's sort of what I, my view, I, I accept, I accept the basic viewpoint as, as a, so far as I can understand it, that, um, that Nicholas Healy and, and David Schindler um, argue for, and even if I didn't accept that viewpoint, I would want also to, to um, think, think with um, Charles Cardinal Journey, I think, I think he's an important figure in these discussions. Um, now he was associated with Maritan, and usually people who are concerned about this um, don't like Maritan at all. But <laughs> you know, Journey, I think, is a is a deep thinker, and he has a, an, an entire ecclesiology, um, and he he thought about this problem in a in a very profound way. So, I, I think that Journey might be someone you know to read on the topic. I also said um, Healy and Schindler, and then also. You know, obviously anything that Russell Hittinger uh, writes as well. And then also, of course, um, Joseph Ratzinger, what, what he said in 2005. But look, the, um, again, you do have to kind of think about these matters and, and in the sense of here you are going to, are going, you're looking to, to tradition and you're asking, you're asking questions about, about like what, what parts of, of our, of the, of the handing on of our faith, you know, what, what parts of these, this have been taught definitively by the church and, and what parts have, um, have not been taught definitively. So, so you're going to, there, there I think you will get into some debate over, um, you know, whether, whether the, the doctrine on church state that was taught in the 19th century and, and um, I think somewhat in to the 20th century, but certainly the 19th century church state doctrine, like what aspects of, of that um, are, are definitively um, taught and, and then what aspects are, are not um, definitively taught. But, you know, when you kind of get down to the bottom line, though, as I see it, um, so, so these are matters of debate. And, um, but then once you get down to the bottom line and you've read everything, you know, you've read all the authors that I just mentioned and, and, and so on, you know, kind of the bottom line issue, as I, as I see the issue, um, has to do with, um, you know, what, what, how are we going to, to treat, um, I, let's, let's turn it, let's turn it around. Uh, okay, let's, let's turn it around. Let's think more about, um, let's just say that you and me were um, Episcopalians. Well, okay, or or maybe maybe we're um, we're Muslims, you know. How about how about if we be Muslims for today? So you got to turn it around. You got to think of it like this, and or we can just be Episcopalians, and or Anglicans. And so, in as you probably know, in the in the um, in the 16th century, it wasn't safe to be a Catholic in an Anglican realm because um, there wasn't there wasn't the fact is that Catholics were a danger to the state in the sense that um, 
you know, the, the good of the state, the basic, the basic argument always is that the common good of the state requires um, that the church um, guide the state in order for, for the common good. And, and you don't want to have heretics running around because heretics, um, they, they weaken the state by, by um, turning people from, from the truth. You know, so that's the problem with heretics is heretics, they not only um, cause their own eternal damnation, but people who don't believe the truth um, weaken the state by undermining um, the common good by, 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 because they, they've turned away from the truth. And so therefore they do things that are against the truth and they, um, they also attack the truth. You know, they, they, um, they, public, they try to publish things against the truth. They spread, they spread falsehood. They, um, but they also do things, you know, maybe they get involved in, in some, some things that we, we know to be sins and so on. So the way that it used to be to handle these people, you know, and just imagine like if we're Muslims or if you imagine you're, we're all talking, you and me are talking, we're Muslims or else we're Anglicans in the 16th century. So the way it used to be to handle these people is that you would, um, you would give them some opportunity to convert you know, in, unless they were, unless they were Jews, you know, and then, and then if you might, you might even allow them to worship in private, so long as they did nothing public, you know, you, you would not allow them to, to build houses of worship, you know, unless they were Jews, you would, you would allow, um, in, in the ghetto, you, ghetto areas, you would allow, um, synagogues to be built, uh, perhaps, but, uh, often, oftentimes you wouldn't allow that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but but the point the point is that what you would do then is for the common good, um, and to make sure that that the whole society is functioning in accord with the truth. You would um, you would if 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 the person fell away from let's say they rejected they rejected the Anglican faith or they rejected the Muslim faith. If they fell away from that faith, then what you do is you bring them in and you talk to them, give them a chance to convert. And then, if they won't convert, then you could expel them from the land, or you could um, you could also the death penalty also you know for for damn you know the state could implement the death penalty, um, or or you might simply persecute them by taking away their goods and making sure that they were um, you can you can imprison them, and so on. So my my point is that this is the bottom line. The bottom line is if Suan tomorrow. Is, ceases to be a Catholic. Like tomorrow you become a Baptist. Well, what do I do with you? You know, do I um, allow you to build a, any house of worship? Because Baptist, Baptist faith is false. And it doesn't build up the common good because how, how could falsehood build up the common good? So Suan becomes a Baptist. So what in the heck am I gonna do with him? Okay, well, I bring him in, but he's, he insists he's gonna go, he, he says, he's gonna go proclaim the Baptist gospel because he's, you know, um, Suan says that the state can have no impact on him. And he knows that the church is false. He hates the Catholic Church. And he tells, he tells, um, he says, you people are enslaved to the Pope and you're enslaved to everything. And he hates the Catholic Church. And, and you say, my gosh, this guy is a complete mess. And so you say, well, what do we do? Well, we can't let Suan run around. We can't let Suan cause damage in, um, in, our, in the state because that would damage the common good. And it would um, weaken the faith of, of the common people. So let's, what do we do with Suan? Well, maybe we could expel him, or should we? Should we give him the? the should we? Maybe we should give him the death penalty for, um, you know, for what he's, you know, for what he's done. Uh, okay. See, this is really kind of the bottom line of the thing, and and I was. Um, it has to do also. I was talking to some uh, to a person, and and the person told me that you know, in a Catholic state, and, and he thinks that we, we need to recover a Catholic state, you know, it would be like a Jewish state. It would be essentially like, um, like is the state of Israel. And so you, if you're not a Catholic, you would not have full citizenship. You know, you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to serve on, um, you know, I'm, I'm not now talking about Israel. I'm just talking about his ideas, okay? So the basic idea would be like, you would not be able to serve on the law courts. You wouldn't really be able to be a lawyer. You could not. Um, you couldn't be a professor of certain disciplines because you would be too filled with your falsehood. Um, you probably could be a medical doctor. <laughs> you could. You could certainly be involved in um, 
finance. But you you could not be um, you couldn't be a politician, and you could not um, you know have citizenship rights, and so you'd be and so therefore you wouldn't really be allowed to vote. Do you understand? These are very these measures. Um, we have to think about this, you know how, and we need to think about it, like how do we like it when Catholics are treated like this? By the way, soon we're going to have a totally secular state. Catholics are going to get treated um, like this, you know, but two wrongs don't make a right. You know, so do we, is this how Christians should treat other, other people? You know, is this the kind of state that, that really um, reflects Christ? But anyhow, these are, these, are think, these are things to think about in terms of whether we really want to compel people who in conscience, today they were Catholic, but now they're Baptists, and in conscience they have to be Baptist. So are we going to compel them to lie? Are we going to ask them to lie, to go, to pretend to go to mass, or are we going to force them to go to mass at least nine times a year, even though we know they they don't believe, even though we, even though in conscience they reject the church and and they are Baptist? You, you see, these are very serious matters about compelling um, people of conscience. I, I find it very worrisome. Uh, and, and my point is that Dignitatis um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't reject Catholic states. I don't think the Dignitas Hamane does what people who are concerned about it um, say it does. Um, but but I, I just think, I think people need to think deeply about, about really, th these, are, these are matters where if you look back in the, in the history of the Catholic Church, there's been, there's been some very, very serious problems, um, like burning heretics, like, um, you know, all the persecutions of Jews, the incredible amount of persecution that Jewish people endured. So, so I'm just saying that we got to, um, before we sort of like go back to the golden past and, and so on, we want to think about all this. But I, I began the whole comment just by saying, well, let the first, let the first thing we do is like read, read Schindler's book, um, which he co-authored with Healy. And then we, you know, read, um, read Russ Hinger and, and then read Charles Rene and, and let's think about this, you know, um, That was, a, that was a really nice and rigorous answer, Dr. Levering. Uh, okay. Let me, ask you, let me ask you one last question, and I think we can wrap up the interview here. So um, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the, the SSPX and the Rad Trad movement, you know. Uh, and, you know, like the SS, where I am right, right now studying at university here at K-State, Kansas State mm -hmm. University, I'm very close to St. Mary's. And, you know, often I can just drive down and be in the SSPX community and then move out, you know. Okay. And then also, um, what is it, uh, uh, when, when it comes to the Rad Trad movement, you know, it's mainly like an online sort of movement, especially with people with YouTube channels and yeah. podcasts who have just kind of, you know, attacked Bishop Barron or have just really said they reject the Second Vatican Council or they think it was, it's part of the, of the woes that the Catholic Church is currently facing. Could you comment on the SSPX and the, the, uh, the Rad Trad movement? Okay, well, and I do want to do, I want to do a quick answer to the other two questions that your friend asked, though, <laughs> but, um, Oh, sure, okay. But, look, yeah, in terms of, but, but, I'll, but I'll, let me answer this one first, though. Well, well, look, but the fact is that, that the church is, is, um, oh, as always, the church, I think, is in need of reform, and there, there is, there are real resources in the preconciliar period for reform and for renewal. In other words, the church is always facing different problems. So, so there's no reason that the church can't um, recall upon, it, it should call upon um, the preconciliar period um, to face um, certain problems in dealing with, especially, especially with um, what I've called um, liberal Protestantism, anything that rejects the dogmatic principle or the sacramental principle of the church. The church does need to be careful and to, um, to retrieve there's no, nothing wrong with retrieving things that are preconciliar. Of course, of course, the church should have all all her heritage, and so um, you know there there are dangers facing the church, and and so on. And so I, I see no I myself see no problem, you know, with um with kind of efforts to retrieve and to to deepen um, our current as uh, faith our current practice, um, and so to my mind that's what the the SSPX 
and then also the rad trad you know they're basically they always kind of emphasize the problems and they they don't they don't point to any of the of the good things that have happened since the second Vatican council but they really emphasize the problems and there are real problems and so i far be it for me to to deny you know this the uh, reality of these problems and then but i would i would want to say a couple things first of all we we have to keep um the communion of the church under under the post I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing more like the defined doctrine than that. That's a total, that's a defined doctrine. So the unity of the church under the Pope and to, to undermine that unity is a very serious sin. So um, let's be really careful there because that's a deep sin against charity. And, and if there's anything infallible, that's gotta be, that's gotta be it. You know, that we don't want to sin against charity by undermining the unity of the church as led by the successor Peter and, and also, um, you know, to to say to make arguments that that somehow, um, you know, somehow like the the successor of Peter really isn't the successor of Peter. No, no, that's that's just pure silliness and and ridiculous. You know, because and you find it that way because they a lot of times people who make that argument they can't figure out which was the last pope that really was the successor of Peter. Then they're going to argue forever. They're going to it's it's Protestantism. That's what this is. Um, if you if you study. If you study Protestantism, that they too argue like when did the church, um, you know, decline? Was was it the year one thousand? Was it twelve hundred? Like when when did um, was it four hundred? You know when when did the church um, fail? <laughs> you know anyway, it's a, it's the same basic idea that you get with um, these folks that are saying that the church um, no longer has a valid pope or whatever other kind of ridiculous stuff. But so, but and also then in terms of charity, you know, um, I would say. Uh, you know, if you're going to deal with any bishop or any theologian, and and you got to be and kind of you attack the person, and and you, it, it always becomes very ad hominem, and then you also have to ask yourself, like, I mean, like, I, I mean, are you attacking the person that agrees with you almost on 95% of everything? You know, why why not why not? Um, uh, I mean, I don't know. So I, I feel that there's a lack of charity, but there's also a lack of a lack of sense for. Um, for nourishing the unity of of, uh, of the faith and and so on, so I'm I'm definitely um, concerned about the Red Trad movement. I, I I support elements of I I support retrieving neo scholastic um, and um, all sorts of insights and wisdom from the preconciliar period. I support all that, but um, but this whole thing with the Red Trad seems to be something quite different. It seems to be um, you know very to me you know very very um, very much a step a step that is not moving in the direction of the unity of the church and that is not um going to be able to retain a, an ecumenical council so basically like this is a total gift to the liberal protestants it's like you couldn't have a better gift it's like this is christmas you know i mean there it's like here are the conservative catholics handing over the vatican it's just like you can have the vatican we're conservative catholics we're going to give you the vatican and we're going to give you an ecumenical council it's like here take it all the other economic councils were all true, supposedly, but this final economic council of Vatican II, you can have it, it's false. Man, this is a total gift. This, this is like an attack. It's an attack upon the dogmatic principle, and it's an attack upon the sacramental principle as well. And so it's a, it's a gift. It's literal Protestantism. In a, it's a form of that, really. But even though they do it as conservatives, it's, just, it's really devastating for, um, for the Catholic Church. And so this is not the way. You know, they're, but their their motives though their motives are good and their motives are like you got to retrieve things from the preconciliar. There's lots of good there. There's lots of great stuff in the neo scholastic. Well, of course that's all true. You know, so um, that's all good, and we and so we should do that. Um, okay, but let me quickly answer. Let me do the questions. The second, third questions from your friend because I feel guilty for rambling on. <laughs> no, you're good. So let me actually ask them, and then I'll let you answer. Okay, so. Uh, these were okay, Daniel's okay. other two questions. So uh, I'll just, I'll read them in their entirety, you know, to give the audience all the details and then okay. Dr. Lever, you can answer however you want. So here are the two, uh, the last few questions that my friend asked. So he said, again, specifically, does the ecclesiology of Lumen Gentium and Unitatis Redintegratio differ substantially in doctrine from Pius XII's Mystici Corporis Christi, Pius the uh, 11th, Mortalium Animos, and Leo the 13th, Satis Cognitium, or Cognitum. 
Does Vatican II teach that the mystical body of Christ is identical to the Catholic Church, who are the members of the Church according to Vatican II? And then the last question he asked is, based on the current trends among professing Catholics, how will Vatican II be evaluated in future decades? All right, take it away. <laughs> well, uh, okay, well, there's a lot of, in terms of the practical, I, I think that the Catholic Church is, it's quite clear that um, Unitatis Red and Grazio and Lumen Gentium both teach that the Catholic Church is, is the church founded by Christ. There is no other church. And there, there may be, um, you know, there are, there are elements of sanctification or elements of, of um, you know, other, other churches have, script, have the scriptures and, and, and um, they, they have baptism, you know. So, look, but it's quite clear. In fact, one of my dearest um, Protestant friends recently in, in a book um, called Dogma and Ecumenism has an essay where he, he expresses kind of horror at Unitatis Red and Grazio and, and the, his horror is that he says that Unitatis Red and Grazio teaches that the Catholic Church is, is the church founded by Christ and that the Protestant churches are not. They're not, they're not the church founded by Christ and, and then they're not even like branches of it. He, in other words, as a Protestant, he recognized that what the Catholics were teaching. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So yes, there is a continuity. There's a con that's my point, that there's a continuity, um, that it is this one, you know, the Catholic Church is a church founded by Jesus Christ, and um, the Protestants do not have the sacrament of the Eucharist, they don't have the sacrament of orders, they don't have other sacraments, they do have baptism, they have, they have scripture, of course they don't have scripture in its fullness because they don't have all the books of the Old Testament, but, but so on. So look, there, but there is a difference in attitude, so there's, not any, there's no indifferentism and nor is there um, any denial that the church is, is the one church. The church is a church founded by Jesus, and it has the mark of unity. So there's, there's no indifferentism or denial of that. But, um, but there is a different attitude and different practice. Basically, um, the idea is, do we have to sit around and condemn Protestants? You know, do we have to, do we have to spend our lives condemning, condemning Protestants? And, and the church kind of thought, well, why do we? I mean, let's, and, and so, again, Pius condemned indifferentism, and he was very worried that um, things like the World Council of, of Churches are just, would essentially um, amount to um, an attack on dogma, an attack on, um, and essentially it's like umbrella, umbrella churches, like federations or branches. So none of that is, none of that is accepted by Vatican II. In other words, like, um, all the things that Pius is worried about, Vatican II rejects. But what Vatican II doesn't, where Vatican II differs, though, is basically like, it's basically in terms of the stance or the attitude, it's, it makes an effort to talk about the ways in which that Protestants and also Eastern Orthodox um, participate in the, participate. There's uh, elements of participation. I, I named baptism, for example. You know, or I named, um, I named the, the scriptures. And so Vatican II talks about this, and it also says that we must seek, we must seek to deepen, um, you know, the communal bond among Christians. In other words, that's what ecumenism is all about, is deepening the communal bond about, among Christians so we can value each other, certainly we can learn from each other. I mean, there's a lot of things that Catholics can learn from evangelicals, I, I know that as a fact. And then, of course, we can learn from each other, but we don't, we don't that doesn't mean we're gonna weaken the Catholic Church, but, but we, we're gonna have an attitude not not just of condemnation, you know, not just of um, rejection, condemnation, and sort of negativity. And and this is to me, this is an example of Christian charity. This is how, this is how do unto others as you would they do unto you, you know. Um, this is how Christians ought to, you know, and baptized people are Christians, so Christians ought to behave to each other like this, and Christians should behave to other to non Christians, also. Um, in this way of charity, you know, and of desire to see the good and to recognize the good and, and, and not just to be people running around condemning everybody and, and negative, so negative. This was a concern in the Vatican II um, address this. Now, now there are problems that, pro real problems can arise and problems have arisen after the council. And so they're, they're definitely needs, you know, church always needs renewal and, and so on. Okay, so I answered, I answered, I think I answered that question best I could, but there was, wasn't there one other thing? I forgot, there was, I think there's one other thing that I forgot. Um, I can't remember right now. 
did, did I answer the things or did, did I miss stuff? Let's see here. Uh, so the, the last question my friend asked was about, um, so yeah, you touched on the fact that it is the, uh, the Catholic church is the mystical body of Christ. Sure. And then the other question my friend asked was who are the members of the church according to Vatican II? Catholics. Yeah. Catholics are members, but they have to have charity, faith and charity. You know, so people, you do, you do need interior faith and charity, but if you're a baptized, if you're a baptized Catholic, that means that you're, you're um, a member unless you've separated yourself in some public way. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, that, that's, I mean, so I don't, of course those are members, but the thing is, um, the question is like, can there be people like in, um, who are Baptists, you know, can there be people who will be among, among the saved? You know, and remember that question was answered definitively um, by Pius when, um, before the count, before the council. You know, in response to um, the Fini, the Fini um, crowd, uh, I, I met I met a bunch of the aging Finiites. This was in 1990s. I, I met them at their at their monastery there, Saint Benedict's, uh, in Petersham or somewhere like that. I forget where it was. It was in Massachusetts, and they were wonderful people. They, you know, they're. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, they were all, but look, they knew that they, I hope they knew, but it doesn't matter that Pius rejected their views. So the point is that you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be a Catholic and you don't even have to be a Christian to be among the saved. That The Catholic Church has never taught that because interiorly grace may be working in you and there may be reasons why, why you, um, why you are not a Catholic. There may be very good reasons. For example, um, think of think of the Jewish people as a whole. You know, Catholics have witnessed, um, they proclaim Jesus Christ, but the words, when, when Catholics say the word Jesus Christ to the Jewish people as a whole, uh, what the Jewish people as a whole tend to hear is this history of persecution. And so it, it sounds to them, when we say Jesus Christ, it should mean love and mercy, but the Catholic counter witness has made it mean hate and persecution mm -hmm. and horror. And so this is, you know, this is just a fact, and I could I could talk more about that. But the thing is that there may be reasons why people are not um, are not externally members of the Catholic Church. But we, but Grace, um, you know, uh, Aquinas and others, this has always been a part of the Catholic faith. Um, but it's possible there, for people who are not visibly members to be among the saved, and therefore to be interiorly united, you know, with the Church, um, uh, right? So the church has always thought that. That's a traditional teaching of the church. Yeah. Wait, so, there's something I didn't answer. Though. I know there was. <laughs> well, the last question he asked was, <laughs> the last question he asked was, based on current trends among professing Catholics, how will Vatican II be evaluated in future decades? Well, there, there um, you know, I think that, one thing would be like, is there going to be any Catholics at all in future decades? Remember, Jesus, Jesus said, like, when I when he come back, is there going to be faith on the earth? It may be, it may be that fifty years from now, um, you know, all the Catholics will have separated. The church will be very divided. But you know, you'll you'll have tons of little churches all claiming to be the Catholic Church. You know, you'll have something in in like Springfield, um, Illinois, or something in um, Topeka, Kansas. You know, where where um, or, where the true Catholics are, you know, um, and and then the, you might have in Europe a bunch of other people who are the true Catholics, and then others. You see, I mean, there can be a lot of division in 50 years, and so, I mean, if the main thing is this: is in 50 years, Vatican II will be by by Catholics who are who are Catholic, you know, Catholics who are um, in communion with the Pope. In 50 years, Catholics in communion with Pope will think that Vatican II was a valid ecumenical council. And therefore it's one of the, um, the 20 some, you know, valid ecumenical councils. And those councils deserve respect and deserve to be, it's not like everything they said or every canon that they wrote or everything is um, something that we gotta, gotta now to go do, <laughs> you know, that'd be ridiculous. But, but those councils are, are valid councils and the, um, they, are, they contain the Catholic truth um, that we received. So that's what, that's my point. That's my answer is that Catholics in 50 years will know and praise Vatican II as a valid ecumenical council that taught truth. Now that, that doesn't mean they won't have criticisms. 
And um, I don't think they're going to be forced to read the council. Hopefully, you know, it's tough to read the council documents. It gets boring. <laughs> so maybe by that time, they won't have to read the council. But, um, but the thing is, it's a valid council. We, we praise it. And, and it'd be like, you know, we ought to read the council trend more, you know. So we, we got to read these councils. You know, we, we have to like grin and break and we just go ahead and do it. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Levering, thank you so much for coming out the, uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Levering, is there anything you want to say before I end the episode? Oh, uh, well, I just hope I didn't say anything wrong. You know, no <laughs> theologian, no theologian is, is infallible. I, I'm, just, I'm just a little theologian, you know, and no, no bishop is infallible, no theologian is infallible. So I understand that we're going to have disagreements, there are going to be disagreements, and, and, and that um, I may say something wrong and so on. The main point is, um, you know, let's disagree with charity. Let's, let's try to um, see the good. Let's, um, let's follow St. Paul, what St. Paul says when Christians are divided in, Corinth, in the Corinthians. And, you know, St. Paul really urges them to, um, you know, kind of turn to the, to the core, you know, to Christ and his self-sacrificial love, to love that is patient, kind, that endures all things. You know, and that um, you know doesn't want to just. I can't. I can't quote scripture. I never was a Protestant, a Protestant of a Protestant kind. I, <laughs> I did grow up Quaker though. So anyway, but you gotta, you gotta say, you gotta, you know, go back and read what Saint Paul says about like how to handle, um, how to handle this type of thing. The church has always had struggles, and we really need, um, we need charity, and we're gonna need bravery, courage. I mean, obviously, the church is gonna is facing some very serious trials. So we have to really have bravery and, and um, courage and patience and all the, all the virtues that St. Paul talks about. So let's go pray for them. <laughs> me, me first and me first. I'll be, I'll be praying. All right. I'll be to, praying too. To become the kind of feeling. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Levering.